Dyslipidemia. <laughs> what an incredible topic of controversy this has been in medicine all these many years. Dyslipidemia. Dysfunctional lipids floating around the body. So we started off, didn't we, thinking that high cholesterol was the major risk factor. And if we could just block the synthesis of cholesterol in a rate-limiting way through the inhibition of hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A, HMG-CoA reductase, that we could then uh, affect a positive outcome in lowering the incidence of, of vascular disease, the major killer diseases in our society. And that model led ultimately to the development of a whole range of uh, compounds that came out of fungal metabolites, uh, starting with lovastatin, mevacor, and ultimately moving on into a whole family of other statin-related molecules. Some are more fat-soluble than others. And we started to develop this wide body of clinical expertise and experience and probably the most studied drug drugs in the history of pharmacology. And also uh, those that were the most uh, profitable drugs for a long period of time, uh, the number one sellers and the number one driver of profit for the companies that had these drugs in their arsenal. Now, however, we're starting to take a deep breath because new information is coming in. Uh, first of all, what about statin-induced myopathy? We were told that this is very infrequent and is not something to worry about in the general sense. It, only a small percentage of people end up with randomyolysis and these very serious muscle problems. But there was still the report from clinical anecdote of, no, there, there's a lot of these uh, chronic muscle uh, uh, neuromuscular problems that occur with statins. So lo and behold, what do we find? A study has just been done, published, and yes, it is true that there's a lot more statin-induced myopathy than was previously thought. Uh, somewhere between 24 and 50 percent of people on various statins uh, end up with these uh, neuromuscular symptoms. So that's number one. Number two is we found that there were certain genetic types, and I spoke about this in a previous September 2015 little video blog, that are more genetically susceptible to myopathy from statins. These are people that have the genes that are SNPs uh, and, and uh, are related to coenzyme Q10 and, and uh, membrane transport uniquenesses. And uh, if they have a, a, a slow CoQ10 synthesizing SNP, then they are more susceptible to statin-induced myopathy. So those are people that uh, should probably take more CoQ10 and are more concerned about uh, statins, particularly these uh, more fat-soluble, lipid-soluble statins. And now we have a new report. And this new report is uh, the third report of its type uh, around what are called cholesterol ester transport protein inhibitors, CETP inhibitors, that dramatically lower uh, cholesterol in the blood and do so in ways that modulate the way the cholesterol is packaged into its little carrier molecules, things like VLDLs, IDLs, LDLs, and HDLs. And we find that these CETP inhibitors actually uh, reduce the amount of cholesterol that's found in one of those packages, the HDL molecule. So they, they change the density of HDL. So what are the results of this most recent study? Well, for the third time now with the CETP inhibitors, it's found the results are not good. Yes, they dramatically lowered cholesterol in the blood, but they were associated with increased incidence of heart disease. This is a similar thing that was seen with Perceptipid in the trial with Pfizer uh, just a, a few years ago. And therefore, what we are starting to see is it's not just cholesterol in the blood, but it's how it's packaged and how it's transported. Then you add on top of this another very interesting uh, study that was just published recently about triglycerides in the blood. And it turns out that there is a genetic SNP uh, related to a, um, a specific uh, protein that is involved with uh, triglyceride metabolism. Finding that people who had this SNP are individuals who were not breaking down their triglycerides as rapidly and not uh, re releasing the fats into cells as quickly. And they had a lower incidence of vascular disease, suggesting that maybe the, this would be a desirable characteristic. If we could block this particular process with a drug, we could produce the same positive benefit as people who have this genetic uniqueness. But yet, when animal models were done in which they intentionally block this particular step uh, to lower their triglycerides uh, and alter their metabolism, that lo and behold, they found that actually these animals ended up getting more fulminant problems with regard to vascular disease and, and early death. So now we start saying, well, is it really the fat in the blood that's the problem? 
or is it the form of the fat that's in the blood? Is it related to how it's transported, how it's delivered, how it's ultimately metabolized? And once we start mucking around with this system by synthetically modulating the level, by blocking something like uh, a statin drug does or one of these other um, new forms of medication that modulate uh, uh, fat synthesis or fat uh, metabolism, that we end up not producing a favorable effect, but maybe in certain individuals a unfavorable effect. So that takes us to the last kind of part of this evolving story. What about these new uh, PSCK9 inhibiting drugs? Now, were you as surprised as I to see now on television and mass media these being advertised uh, for the treatment of high cholesterol in the general population when they've really been only approved uh, by the FDA for a specific class of people that have uh, very high cholesterol levels and are statin uh, resistant and uh, cannot get their their particular cholesterols down effectively. So it's a very small uh, percentage of the population that would get these injectable PSCK9 inhibiting drugs that cost about $15,000 a year, I might add. Uh, and there is no clinical outcome trials yet available as to whether they actually do lower the incidence of vascular disease. They do lower uh, lipids, cholesterol, uh, and specifically LDL quite dramatically, but we don't know yet whether the uh, outcome of these patients has been successfully improved in terms of vascular pro disease protection. And what we are learning is the more we futz around with this system, the more like we, likely we are to produce an untoward or unexpected uh, uh, side effect because this is a very complex part of our metabolism that's regulated by many hormones, regulated by various transport proteins, has a very significant role to play in cell surface uh, physiology through signaling, uh, and that cholesterol in and of itself is a very important precursor for many things, like the steroid hormones and cholesterol within membranes and bile salts. So all of this complexity sometimes weaves it down into what we think is a simple answer, just block or inhibit a specific enzyme or a specific function. So what's the story say to us right now? The story says, if you can stay away from cholesterol modulating drugs, you're better. If you have to take them, take those that have minimum side effects, those that have longer term clinical outcome trials, and those that avoid these lipid solubility problems that are associated with the inhibition of coenzyme Q10, the myopathies that are often seen in 24 to 50% of patients, and that you then are on the safe side of the dose response curve. So evolving story, yes. As simple as we were told 20 years ago, no. And more to learn about how to really modulate successfully using an effective functional medicine program, cardiovascular risk.